If you're like me, you probably stepped outside at some point at night, and while gazing up at the stars, you see the moon either directly up overhead or off to one side. And it probably sparked a lot of questions in you. Why is the moon bright on some nights and dim on others, and why does the moon cycle the way it does? Well, we're going to answer some of these questions for you today and talk a little bit about the lunar cycle. So I've gone ahead already and drawn this little ball here, uh, this little silver ball, which we'll represent as the moon, and I'll just label it as so. And I've already drawn in the other important components of the moon system, notably the sun and the earth. And obviously this picture is not to scale. In reality, the moon and the earth are really far away from the sun. But for purposes of figuring out the lunar cycle, we're just going to use this diagram. So why does the moon have cycles at all? Well, it turns out that's because the moon orbits the earth. And as it does so, the sun shines differently on the moon depending on where it is relative to both the sun and the earth. And we're going to be mapping these phases out. Now, just by convention, this starts when the moon is in between the sun and the earth, and this is called a new moon. And a new moon looks like nothing in the sky. You really can't see this. And the reason is because that as the light from the sun comes to the moon, it's only going to hit the side that's facing the sun. And since this side of the moon is not visible from the earth, and we'll just draw a little man here in, let's say, the northern hemisphere, who's looking at the moon, to this person here, from their perspective, no visible light is going to be seen on Earth. Since the moon is only visible from reflected light from the sun, none of this light here shown in yellow is going to be able to reach the Earth. So the moon isn't really seen at all during its new phase. So over here on the right, we're going to be tracking of these phases, and we'll just write new. In the next phase of the moon, we'll call that a quarter moon. And in that, we're going to do the same thing. Again, the sun is only going to shine on the side of the moon facing the sun. And so that's going to illuminate this same side, but from the Earth, the moon is going to look different. The moon is now going to look like it's half full. So over here in this chart, we'll just say a quarter moon, and that's going to look half full. So if we were to draw what that would look like, that would look like this, with the moon about half full, and the new moon would just be empty because we can't see it. And as we go from new moon to quarter moon, the moon gradually fills up in light, because this arc gets bigger and bigger as the moon swings around in this direction. So let's have the moon move another 90 degrees around the Earth, and let's see what happens when the moon is in this position. And again, we're going to have the moon illuminated on the sign facing the sun, which is going to be this side. But as you can see from the perspective of the person on Earth, this is going to look completely full, because the part of the moon that's visible from the Earth is completely filled with light. And this is why, when the sun is directly opposite the moon, this is called a full moon, because it's completely full of light. So the next stage we'll put in our chart is full, and this looks like the whole moon is full of light. In the next phase of the moon, it's rotated another 90 degrees, and again the side facing the sun is the only one illuminated. So from the Earth, we only see this is half full. But because it's from the opposite side of the quarter moon, the other side of the moon is full opposite to the quarter moon over here on the left. And this is called a last quarter moon. So we'll label this as last fourth and put it in our chart. Our chart. And it's similar to the fourth, except that the other side of the moon is full. And then the moon rotates its final 90 degrees, and we're back to where we started with the new moon that's not visible from the Earth because the opposite side is illuminated by the sun. And perhaps this would be made clear if I use a different color. So let's say the quarter moon, this person is looking in this direction, and so they only see this arc. And because they only see the purple arc, the yellow of which is illuminated, it's half full. The same is over here. They only see the purple arc in this last quarter, but since the half of it is yellow, only half of the moon is illuminated when this person is looking this direction. When this person is looking towards the full moon, the full moon that they can see is illuminated, so all of it is full. And when they look towards the new moon, none of it's illuminated, because only the far side facing the sun is illuminated, so we can't see the new moon. Now these phases get special names, just based on where they are in the lunar progression, in the progression of the lunar cycle, that is, and we're going to go through those here. And while the moon is growing or shrinking, it gets different names. So from new to full, when the moon is increasing in brightness, we call this waxing, and I'll do this in a different color. When the moon is decreasing in brightness from being full towards being new, this is called waning. So we have a waxing moon that gets brighter, 
and a waning mood that decreases. So we can draw this as this sort of orange color here and the blue color here to denote waning and waxing, respectively. We also have different words to describe moons that are closer to the full or closer to the new side. So if it's in between new and quarter, that's called a crescent moon because we really only see a sliver of the moon, and that's true over here as well. So we'll label this as crescent, and that would be this pink arc right here. And the arc in between, which I'll do in uh, yellow, or let's say orange, this is known as a gibbous moon. And that would be this arc right here, between the quarter moons. So in between last quarter and first quarter, we have a crescent moon, denoted by this pink arc right here. And in between the quarter and last quarter moons, we have a gibbous moon, and that's denoted by this orange arc right here. So now that we've got our lunar cycle down, I'm just going to go ahead and delete this chart of words over here on the right, because what I want to talk about now is the length of this cycle. And it turns out that one of these cycles, going from new moon all the way around to new moon again, takes about 29 and a half days. So we'll say 29.5 days. And this gets a special name. This is called the synodic month. So we'll just write that out. Synodic month. And this is, for a lot of cultures, the way they calculated time in ancient times, just based on the cycles of the moon. But the problem is, is that if you have 12 months of 29 and a half days, this only works out to a year of 354 days. And we know from today that a year is 365 days. So you have a gap of 11 days. And while that might not seem like such a big deal, when you're raising cattle or raising grain or doing anything that depends on the cycle of the seasons, an 11-day gap every single year begins to add up. So you need to have a way to compensate. And this is where we get the idea of leap days or leap months. And in different cultures, you have different ways of dealing with this. So we'll just look at one example, the Hebrew calendar. So the Hebrew calendar is a lunar calendar. And like we've talked about, that means it has months of 29 and a half, or functionally 29 days and 30 days, which gives a 354-day year. So the way they've worked this out is to have a 19-year cycle, which I'll denote by this white bracket, and seven of these are going to be leap years, whereas the remaining 12 are going to not be leap years. And the seven years aren't at random. It's specifically years 3, 6, 8, 11, 14, 17, and 19. And if you think this is confusing, you're exactly right, because in leap years, where you have an extra month, you have two months named Adar. So you could have Adar 1 and Adar 2, which is really just confusing, but it's necessary because you have to match the lunar calendar of 354 days to the solar calendar of 365 days. And different cultures, again, have different strategies for dealing with this, but the ultimate goal is to match the lunar calendar and the solar calendar so you have one year of 365 days.